Good afternoon, everybody. Are you having a good travel con? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, my name is not Matt Kepnes. <laughs> I, surprise. But uh, when Matt asked me if I would like to introduce Pico, I, I leapt at the chance. Um, Pico has been a great, great friend of mine for a long time. And uh, he's also something of a hero for me. So it's nice to have a friend and hero. It's nice to be able to introduce them to you all. I first met Pico in 1988 when I was the travel editor at the San Francisco newspaper. And Pico came out with this amazing book called Video Night in Kathmandu. And as soon as I read it, I wanted to basically republish the whole book in the travel section of the paper, but that wasn't possible. So I published one of the chapters, an amazing, wonderful chapter. And then Pico came to town on his book tour, and we met and uh, hit it off instantaneously and deeply. And I just felt like I'd met a soulmate, really, in the, in the world of travel and in the world of humanity. Um, he's the author of 15 or 16 books. Uh, the first one was Video Night in Kathmandu. Kathmandu. He followed that up with a fantastic book called The Lady and the Monk, which is about a year living in Japan. Um, he's written The Global Soul. All of his books are, are wonderful. I encourage you to get them all and read them all. Um, a recent book that I really love is called Autumn Light. And it's about living in Japan and the lessons he's learned from living in Japan. And it's kind of a nice bookend to that book he wrote early on called The Lady and the Monk, about living in Japan. Um, Pico, in addition to his books, he writes regularly for Time Magazine, the New York Review of Books. He's written for Harper's, the New York Times, the Financial Times. He writes voluminously and vociferously, and he's an incredibly eloquent writer. Anything you can get of his, you should read. It's inspiring and beautiful and thoughtful. He's also given four TED Talks, which have garnered more than 10 million views, which is not bad. <laughs> um, and really, what I, I asked myself what were the adjectives I would use to describe Pico, and this is what I wrote down. Brilliant, deeply spiritual, mindful, eloquent, compassionate, incredibly talented, keenly observant, encyclopedically well-read. And that reminded me of one little tiny moment I wanted to share with you. I'm the chairman of something called the Book Passage Travel Writers and Photographers Conference, and every year we get to hang out with really wonderful writers. One year I was able to invite Pico Iyer and Jan Morris, two of my literary heroes, to the conference. And we were at breakfast together and Jan was sitting here and Pico was sitting here and they were talking about books. And I realized that I was the observer at the intellectual tennis match going, mm, 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 mm. As they just were talking back and forth about all of these books and authors with, with this incredible passion and knowing everything about everything. I was just the, the little kid. I was the ball boy. Um, so he's incredibly well read, but, but most of all, he's wise and compassionate and open hearted and uh, one of the greatest writers I know and one of the greatest human beings I know. Just an incredibly wonderful humanitarian guy. And he's a great friend, he's a very kind friend. And now that I have all you new friends, I'm so happy to introduce one of the most amazing human beings on the planet and a great friend of mine, Pico Iyer. Um, I couldn't have a more heartfelt and, and beautiful introduction than that. As you heard, Don has been such a kind and, and generous friend for more than 30 years, from the back alleyways of Kyoto to the halls of National Geographic. 
to such an extent, as you can tell, I'm aspiring to be Dick Don. You will notice I'm wearing exactly the same costume that Don was wearing. And we didn't organize that in advance. I'm just aspiring to be Don George as, as much as I can. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm just so really, really uh, happy to be here. Uh, if you can believe it, I am such an intrepid and seasoned traveler that I've spent exactly one day of my life before this week in Memphis, 46 years ago. And so it was thrilling to land in the beautiful airport yesterday to see 90 aircraft belonging to the company without which most of us could not survive, Federal Express, uh, to get a glimpse of the Mississippi yesterday afternoon to uh, go through the really stirring Civil Rights Museum uh, this morning. I remember how the great uh, Victorian explorer, Sir Richard Burton, made it his mission to visit the five holy cities on the planet, which he described as Benares, Jerusalem, Rome, Mecca, and of course, Memphis. And as it happens, um, the building in which I have lived for 29 years in Japan in this tiny rented two-room apartment for many of those years rejoiced in the name of the Memphis Apartments uh, in honor of this city's most famous son. Uh, and the person who constructed the building appointed it with uh, these thick pebble glass windows so that the light would be suffused almost as if in a church and we were living in a shrine to the king. Uh, but then somebody else came along and painted the uh, building yellow and renamed it the Lime Village Apartments and Memphis disappeared from my life until this week. I'm also just really happy to be with so many fellow traveler writers. Um, I'm usually the only person sitting at the back of a hall like this uh, trying to work out how I can score some free peanuts or put my dinner on expense account. And most of all, it really means a lot to me uh, to be here with TravelCon. And just the fact that TravelCon has not been defeated by circumstance and has kept going through thick and thin these last two years and is bringing us all together uh, once more. I really feel that travel, as you all know, is alive and well. Uh, the first week of last month, uh, I flew from Osaka to Tokyo to San Francisco to Santa Barbara. I drove across California. I got in a plane in LA. I flew to Qatar and then Zanzibar. And I sailed across the Indian Ocean to the Seychelles. And then the next week, I flew back from Mahe to Dubai to Bangkok to Osaka. And I think many people around us have picked up that rhythm again. Uh, my only sadness about this gathering is that a part of me wishes it were called Travel Pro, because <laughs> I think that's really what all of us in this room are, and that's how we would like to style ourselves. Um, we all know there are lots of pros and cons in travel, but I think by definition, everybody here feels that the pros outweigh the cons. At the same time, I'm sure many of you so enjoy your job that you have friends who say, it must be a con. <laughs> Why are you enjoying it so much? And I'm sure even before the pandemic, you have friends who would say, what's the point of traveling? Uh, you can see online some festival in Cuba that you would never be able to get to in person. You can turn on the TV and travel to a remote temple in Tibet that you would never get to as a regular traveler. And if you really want to taste the spices of Vietnam or hear the rhythms of Haiti or listen to the stories of Ethiopia, just go to the nearest big city in North America. Go to Toronto or New York or San Francisco. You can experience all of those there. And of course, that's really true. I think one of the great beauties of the modern moment is that all the world has come to our doorstep. And yet, I feel, and I'm guessing all of you feel, that it's everything essential about a place that you can't get at second hand. It's the smell of frankincense when you step into your hotel lobby in Oman. It's the wind in your hair when you're sitting on some treeless hill in Iceland and looking out over this great volcanic waste. Uh, it's the sound of the blues on Beale Street or uh, the taste of okonomiyaki in Hiroshima. 
And I sometimes think that one reason that food has become so essential to people's travels nowadays is you can't taste sushi online yet. <laughs> you have to go to Jiro's little uh, bar in a subway station in Tokyo to experience it. And I never forget, five years ago, I was at the TED conference in Vancouver, and I stepped into this state-of-the-art virtual reality booth. And as soon as I did, uh, I could see the vibrant greens of the Amazon rainforest, and I could hear the cawing of these tropical birds. I could almost feel the precipitation on my face. But when I stepped out of it again, I thought, it's everything essential about the experience I couldn't get there. It's the silences, the sense of surprise, the intangibles. It's the sweat on my brow that would have come if I'd really earned that experience. And I think even now, it's really hard to fall in love at second hand. And I think in these days when so much reality is virtual, so much intelligence is artificial, and so much news is fake, it's more important than ever really to go out into the world and to be reminded of how much we don't know and how much doesn't fit into our explanations. And I always worry that in the age of streaming news, what we really lose out on is human complexity. And in the age of the iPhone, we forget that all the images in the world never add up to real life. And in the age of the small screen, it's really hard to catch the larger picture. And I think all of you know that what we most want to find is what we never thought to look for. And by that, I mean if any of us were going for the first time ever to Paris tomorrow, I'm sure we'd want to go to the Louvre and we'd want to ascend the Eiffel Tower and maybe see the Chateau at Versailles. But I'm equally sure that the memory we would take home is of some backstreet bistro that's not in any guidebook or website that's on nobody's itinerary and that we can imagine we've discovered ourselves. So I thought today I would just share with you three trips that speak for many, many more and probably will relate to some of your experiences that just remind me uh, why travel, which has always been a great luxury, is now more and more a necessity. And how travel writing and everyone who does it in any form can touch some truth that no YouTube video and no television documentary, however great its production values, could match. Uh, I remember when I was young, I read the book that almost became my Bible, Walden by Thoreau. And at the end of it, you'll recall he has this stirring sentence, it's not worth the while to go around the world to count the cats in Zanzibar. Well, as you heard, <laughs> I was in Zanzibar last month. I was counting cats. There were cats in every nook and cranny. I was losing count of cats. But most of all, while looking at the cats, I was seeing wonders I could never have imagined back in Massachusetts. And I thought Thoreau was wrong in that way. But the reason I've always loved him is that he knew that travel isn't about seeing the sights. It's about getting a new way of seeing. And as soon as you have that new way of seeing, even the old places look different. And he knew that travel wasn't really about movement. It's about being moved. So a few years ago, I woke up one day in Las Vegas. And I flew west to San Francisco. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds like a lead up to a joke waking up in Las Vegas. Um, I flew west to San Francisco. And then I flew even further west to Tokyo. And then I flew even further west to Beijing. And then I got on another plane. And when I got off at my final destination, I really thought I was back in Nevada. Because there, right in front of me, was the tallest tourist hotel in the world, 105 stories high, this blue glass structure shaped like a rocket. And over there was an Arc de Triomphe, just like the one in Paris, but 30 feet taller. And everywhere I looked were gleaming high rises and amusement parks and uh, a theater designed like a water mill. And when I went over to check into my hotel, it had two wings. Each of them were 45 stories high. And I went down into the basement to explore. And the first thing I saw was three slot machines. <laughs> and then I really thought I was back in Las Vegas. But uh, Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea, which is where I'd ended up, of course, couldn't be further from Las Vegas in its basic values and assumptions. In fact, 90% of North Korean citizens aren't even allowed to leave their hometown or to learn to drive without government permission, so they've never seen their 
showcase capital. And even the fortunate 10% who get to live there, if they so much as glance at a foreign newspaper, are subject to execution. And even I, as just a, a bungling tourist, was reminded before I touched down that if I so much as folded a newspaper containing a photograph of a flower named after the late leader, Kim Jong-il, I was subject to imprisonment. So you're not in Kansas anymore there. And I knew this because I'd been to North Korea before. And I knew that really this whole beautiful capital is a, a stage set, that all those gleaming high rises are completely unoccupied. They're ghost buildings. Uh, and when you descend into one of their beautiful subway stations, which is all golden statues and dazzling murals, and get into a subway car, very soon a, a local will come up to you, very friendly, and say in perfect English, I really hope you're enjoying your trip to the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. And you realize it's an actor who's been planted by the government to make a good impression on the occasional visitor. Uh, so actually, on my most recent trip, I decided to look at North Korea through the lens of its film industry, because the Pyongyang film studios are three times larger than the Paramount lot back in Hollywood. And the late leader, Kim Jong-il, as you may know, is said to have had the largest video library in the world, 20,000 titles strong. Uh, he wrote a whole book, 329 pages, and I've labored through it twice on the art of the cinema. And he notoriously, at one point, abducted uh, a celebrated South Korean actress and then later a celebrated South Korean director in an attempt to boost his film industry. So most of what you're seeing there is fake, but of course you go to a place like North Korea for those moments when humanity escapes in spite of everything, when you see the little white Chanel clip in the hair of your charming guide, Miss Peng, or when in the safety of a minivan, a local cranes forward and asks whether Tim Cook's management style at Apple is very different from Steve Jobs's. Or when you meet an, another handler who tells you about working with Dennis Rodman when the NBA star was visiting, uh, and who tells you that for whatever reason, Mr. Rodman refused to call this guide by his name, which was surprising because the guide's name was just one letter, O, Mr. O. <laughs> but Dennis Rodman, for whatever reason, decided to call him Trevor. <laughs> None of this takes away from the brutality of the regime, but for me it just reminds me how much I don't know. And how when I'm back in California and I'm pontificating on human values and, and, and reality and universal truths, nothing I say begins to apply to North Korea. And it also reminds me that a place doesn't have to be pleasant to be interesting. Uh, I often will get much more out of meeting some wild-eyed, disheveled old man than a gorgeous supermodel. And for those reasons, I'll go to Jerusalem much more often than to Maui. Uh, I'd never call Jerusalem reassuring or comfortable or easy, but it does what, for me, every destination ought to do, which is send you back a slightly different person from the one who left, and with more questions than you had before you left. And I think whenever I go to North Korea, it confirms my sense that actually in this age of globalism, we're often more provincial than ever before. And you all know how easy it is these days to be surrounded by people who think like you and feel like you and maybe look like you. Uh, I used to write uh, on World Affairs for Time magazine. And in those days, uh, we had seven people on one corridor and we were drawing from the reports of maybe 25 international bureaus. Now, I think there's maybe one poor soul in the whole of Time magazine covering the whole world, drawing from the reports of maybe seven foreign bureaus. And as you know, all our newspapers and um, TV networks are similarly diminished, right? which is thank heavens for people like you who are filling in those gaps. And whenever I arrive in North Korea, what really scares me is that nobody there can really put a face or a voice to the United States. And of course, it's much easier to launch a nuclear missile against an abstraction or against a name than against a human being. But then I come back here, and I think what's even more scary is that we know so little about a place like North Korea. And we don't have the excuse of a government that won't allow us to leave our hometown or that will execute us for looking at a foreign newspaper. 
And that always reminds me why I'm grateful for people like everyone in this room. Well, about 11 months before I went most recently to North Korea, I was visiting my mother one day in Santa Barbara, California, and I got into a plane. And I flew through a day and a night and a day and much of another night. And when I disembarked, it was 2.25 in the morning, and I was in the great Iranian holy city of Mashhad. And I came through customs, and there waiting for me was a guide who was dressed in a beautiful um, dark jacket and freshly pressed slacks, as if he too was aspiring to be Don George. And <laughs> we got into our car, and as we were inching through the surprisingly crowded streets, he started pointing out every passerby who looked either like Mr. Bean or John Cleese, which was not really what I'd expected coming to revolutionary Iran. And then we pulled up at our luxurious hotel, which was left over from before the revolution. We went into the lobby. Ave Maria was being piped through the lobby. And in a distant corner of the lobby, I saw a small sign in English saying mosque, pointing to a little room. But right next to the mosque was a Swarovski jewelry shop dripping in crystals. And right next to that was a Yves Rocher boutique selling the latest beauty products from Paris. And I went up to my room, and my room was, in fact, quite spartan. It just had three amenities. There was a, a copy of the Holy Quran, and there was an arrow pointing to Mecca, and there was a TV. And I thought, oh, fantastic, my first chance ever to watch Iranian television. So I turned it on, and what should I see but Piers Morgan on CNN talking about gun control. And this was so unexpected. I thought, I've got to tell my friends back in California. So I went online, and lo and behold, the internet connection in the holy city of Mashhad was much faster than the one in the hills of California that I'd had two days before. And by then, it was pretty much time for breakfast. So I went down again to the lobby. And by now, for whatever reason, it was filled with young women in the latest uh, fashions for Chanel and Dior under their hijabs tapping away on smartphones. And I went out into the street to see where I'd landed up because it had been hard to make out at 3 AM. And I found I was on this broad, spotless boulevard, again, lined with high rises. And so I went across the street to see what they contained. And every last one of them was a bank. It was really as if I'd ended up in Dubai. And honestly, every hour of the next 16 days was equally rich in surprises. But my very first night, I thought, I want to see the city unchaperoned. So I told my guide and my driver to go off to dinner. And then I stole down to the taxi desk in the lobby and asked if they could find me a car to take me into the center of town. And very soon, a young guy, maybe 30 years old, quite friendly with very good English, came up to me. And he led me out to his battered compact, and we took off. Unbeknownst to me, I had arrived in Mashhad on the single most festive week of the year, uh, the birthday of the saint buried in the central shrine. So five million people had come from every corner of the Shia world to mark the occasion. All the streets were strung with fairy lights. And when we got to the central shrine, which is in fact the largest mosque in the world, it's a network of these seven beautiful marble courtyards, we could barely walk. Everywhere we looked, there were people seated on the ground, nibbling at sweetmeats, sipping tea, releasing doves into the blue-black sky, stretched out to sleep sometimes because they were spending seven days and seven nights there. And all around them were these huge video screens, even bigger than that one, on which black turbaned ayatollahs were delivering sermons. It was really quite a scene. And when we got to the Holy of Holies, the innermost sanctum where the saint is buried, my guide looked over at me assessingly, and I think he decided I was sincere. I'd come all this way to learn about his country. And so he invited me in. And it was a very tiny space, not much bigger than this stage, absolutely packed, of course. And very quickly, we got separated. And at one moment, I looked across at him, and his hand was on his heart. And he was walking backwards, so he would never present his back to the long dead saint. And there were tears welling in his eyes. It was really, he was just a picture of Islamic piety. But when we were back out in the street, walking towards his car, 
he told me how his wife was a blonde Yorkshire woman who was waiting for him in England and expecting their first child. And then he told me that he had paid a human trafficker $2,500 to smuggle him into England in the back of a truck, breathing through a tube so that he wouldn't be detected. And then he told me how um, the British government very magnanimously had given him a court-appointed solicitor and translator, and they had worked for three whole years to win him asylum status. In other words, he'd risked his life to flee Iran, and now he was risking his life every year to come back to visit the mother and the mosque and the hometown that he missed so much. And when he dropped me back at my hotel, I thought, my heavens, Iran has been on the front pages of our newspapers every day for the past year, but I'd never heard about a dissident stealing back into the country from which he'd fled. And I couldn't remember ever reading about somebody, a very pious Islamic soul, who nonetheless didn't want to live in this particular Islamic republic. And this was <laughs> this is really embarrassing to me because I was the guy who'd written an article on Iran for Time magazine, drawing from reports uh, from my colleagues. And it was doubly embarrassing to me because I'd financed my first book, the one that Don mentioned, by writing a 6,000-word essay, 6,000-word, yeah, essay for the Smithsonian on Iranian history. And it was quadruply embarrassing for me because later on in my life, I spent four whole years reading up on and researching everything I could get on Iranian history to publish a 370-page novel, partly set there, though I'd never been. And yet, as you can tell, within four hours of getting there, I had learned more than from four years of research. And within 16 hours of being there, um, I realized I didn't have a clue. And this really confirmed my sense that in this age of information, we sometimes know less about the rest of the world than ever before. And sometimes we know least of all about the countries we hear most about, like North Korea or Iran or Cuba. Um, we always hear quite a lot about their leaders or their battered economies, maybe their nuclear policies, but we have a painfully negligent sense of daily life and just regular folks. And Whenever we hear a word like North Korea, I think we just see one face, which is the face of the leader, not 25 million other people, which is just what any authoritarian leader wants. And of course, whenever anyone from North Korea hears the word USA, they just hear or they just think of one person, the occupant of the White House, and not 320 million of the rest of us. And I often think that one small reason for any of us to go to Pyongyang or Tehran is that everybody I meet suddenly remembers, oh, a, a typical American may nowadays be somebody like me, small and dark and very interested in their country. And whenever I go to Tibet or Ethiopia or Burma, or Cuba, the people I meet there would do anything to come to Memphis or to see Las Vegas or to go to New York City, but they will never have the means or the freedom to do so. And I've always felt it's really up to the fortunate few, like those of us in this room and many of us in this country, to go and see them, to initiate the conversation, because they'll never be able to come and see us. And of course, this applies domestically, too. I'm blithely talking about going to Iran and, and North Korea. I've never been to Mississippi. I've never been to North Dakota. And people in those states might rightly feel upset about that, that I'm going around the world and I don't know my own country. But I'm hoping you can tell from what I've said that everything that was interesting about Iran lay in the contradictions, the ambiguity, the things I could not make sense of. Well, again, I'm sure many of you have friends who will say, look, what's the point of travel? Wherever you disembark tomorrow, you will be greeted by Ronald McDonald, <laughs> the ambiguous green goddess of Starbucks, and Brad Pitt. And my answer to them would be, come to Japan sometime, which is where I live. I will take you to our local Starbucks. Uh, we will enjoy cherry blossom frappuccinos, which are not on the menu at the one on Monroe Street I visited this morning. And we will be sitting above Sanjo Bridge, which is probably the single most historic place in that 1,300-year-old city where so many of its formational events have taken place. 
Come to my local McDonald's sometime and look up at the menu, and you will see chicken tatsuta burgers and bacon potato pies. I don't know what those are. Uh, if you come in September, you will see moon viewing burgers in honor of the great East Asian festival of the harvest moon. And more important, the people around you in my local McDonald's are very uh, elegant and well-dressed young women worthy of a hotel lobby in Mashhad. And everything about the way that they speak and they don't speak and they cover their mouths when they laugh is just as Japanese as it would have been in the 16th century. Really, a McDonald's in Japan is as deeply Japanese as a sushi bar would be. Uh, as for Brad Pitt, <laughs> he's such a godhead that he's actually entered the language, Brad P. And I think all of us know, but it's worth remembering, that these days everyone in the world is essentially streaming the same movies and TV shows, but come out of them having seen a totally different movie. Because every country not only translates Game of Thrones into its own language, but into its own context and its, its own tradition, its own history. If any of you here saw Kenneth Branagh's recent movie Belfast, for example, were you to see that in Beirut, it would have a very different meaning. And were you to see it in the Vatican City, it would have still a third meaning. Uh, this really came home to me some years ago um, when a movie called The Sixth Sense came out. Some of you may be <laughs> old enough to remember it. It was about a, a single mom who had a little boy who saw ghosts. And in response, she um, took him to a psychiatrist, very unexpectedly played by Bruce Willis. And um, I saw that film as soon as it came out in Japan. And I looked around at my Japanese wife and my Japanese neighbors. And I realized they weren't freaked out by the ghost at all. <laughs> They've been living comfortably with ghosts in Japan for 1,400 years. But they were, I think, unsettled by the psychiatrist because they don't traditionally have those in their, in their culture. When I moved to Japan in the late 1980s, there were four licensed psychiatrists in all of Tokyo, population 15 or 20 million. And I thought, well, if we were watching the same movie in Iraq now, nobody would be freaked out by the ghost or the psychiatrist, but they might be unsettled by the notion of a single mother. And then I went back to California, and my mother said, hey, have you seen this new movie, The Sixth Sense? I really want to see it. And so I gallantly accompanied her to the cineplex. And in Santa Barbara, <laughs> everyone was just terrified that Bruce Willis was trying to act. Um, <laughs> I, I don't mean any disrespect. I know he's going through hard times right now, but it's a trivial example, but really it became a completely different film in California from the one I'd seen in Japan. And that's why you know, I've been traveling the world constantly for 48 years now, and I think you can really only conclude it's a small, small world if you're in Disneyland. Um, to me, the distances and the differences between us are greater than ever before, partly because of the illusion of smallness and closeness, and that's what makes the world so inexhaustibly fascinating. And that's why the world is always so much richer than our ideas of it. And in fact, the crisscrossing of cultures in the last 40 years has thrown up a whole new dimension of exoticism. Um, it sounds facetious, but it's really true that in the late 1980s when I was in Beijing, I felt I could see more about China by going to the new KFC parlor in one corner of Tiananmen Square than by going to the Forbidden City in another corner of the square, because I didn't really know enough about China to understand the Forbidden City. Uh, and so just before I come to the concluding part of this, I'll, I might share something I've never shared before, because I haven't really been in a room full of people who cover the world until today. And that is just, I have three rules for myself when I'm writing about a place, and I don't know if they chime with your rules or if they'd be any use to you, but my first one is never to try to be only positive about a place. Because if I am, I feel that suggests that I'm either too lazy really to look at it or too dishonest to say what I truly think about it. And for me, places are really like people. And truly, they're like my friends. And when I'm describing my friends, what really distinguishes almost all of them is their eccentricities and their foibles, as with me. That's what makes them lovable. And if I were only to say glowing things about a friend, I think that would almost be an insult to reduce him to a kind of stereotype. Uh, my second rule for myself is always to try to remember that travel remains an exercise in curiosity, not in consumerism. So if you, if you are a master chef or if you really understand food, then I think it makes a lot of sense to spend three hours in an elaborate meal in Paris. But when I'm in Paris, 
I want to wander the streets, smell everything, see everything, look through the windows, eavesdrop on people all around me. And I, I want to spend those three hours consuming the whole culture rather than just a single meal. And I always remember that the writers who've taught me about the rest of the world, whether it's Kate Harris or Annie Dillard or Peter Matheson or Anjan Sundaram, they're the ones whose notion of a souvenir is not uh, a, key, a keychain or a postcard, but a question, a deeper inquiry. And the photographers who've really shown me the world are by definition the ones who've never taken a selfie and are not on Instagram. Um, I think my third rule for myself is never to be afraid of analysis because I think that's part of how we form an impression of any new person or any new situation or place that we meet. Uh, I was in San Francisco four days ago and I think if somebody asked me to write a piece on San Francisco, I would want to think, what are the city's illusions about itself? It's such a beautiful city. What does it lack that less beautiful Los Angeles has? What, uh, um, what is San Francisco's notion of itself that doesn't chime with mine? And I know that editors will often ask you to write about the five cool new restaurants in Luang Pagang. And if I get such an invitation, I'll say yes, and I'll cover the restaurants. But at the same time, I'll try to write a much deeper, more personal piece about how Luang Pagang has transformed me and smuggle it into a different kind of magazine or my next book or just share it with my friends. Um, if I find myself in Beijing on assignment, what a perfect time to spend three days inexpensively looking at North Korea again. Um, so to go back to this point about analysis, I've chosen to live in Kyoto for 34 years nearby, and I love everything about the city, but truly, one of the greatest pieces I've ever read was written by the writer that Don mentioned, the immortal Jan Morris. And when she went to Kyoto, she found it haunting and spooky and cruel and blood-soaked. And she's so attuned to the history, as I am not, that she found really unsettling currents that I had never discovered. And I'm forever grateful to her for showing me maybe a shadow side of the city that I love. So let me just end with um, one final story. Uh, earlier this century, I found myself in Yemen. Why? <laughs> well, why else? But I was retracing the footsteps of a 15th century Chinese Muslim eunuch admiral who led his treasure ships on seven great journeys across the Indian Ocean, on two of which they landed in Yemen. Uh, China, as you all know, has not had a history of exploration the way that Europe has, but there was this one moment in the 15th century when it did send out these forays. And in the course of my journey, I found myself in the southern port city of Aden. And by chance, I had been in Aden at the age of two. And at that time, Aden was the largest port in the whole world outside of Manhattan. So it just buzzed with all the sometimes illicit energy that arises whenever East first touches West. Well, when I returned to Aden this century, it was to find the most blasted, devastated place I think I've ever seen. The, the Brits had come and gone, the Soviets had come and gone, North Yemen was often at war with South Yemen, no shops, no restaurants, certainly no playgrounds. There were goats foraging on the main street. And when the occasional car stopped at a red light, sunken-cheeked old women would come and hammer at the windows asking for a handout. Uh, it was very hard to find a place to stay there, as you could imagine. But I finally found, by chance, a very nice Sheraton hotel, like the one we're staying at on the beach. But every time I stepped into it, I had to go through a security machine, as in one of our airports. And when I finally went out to the beach, it was totally empty. And then I looked more closely, and I saw there were four armed guards on one side of me, I guess, protecting me from Yemen. And then I looked on the other side, four armed guards over there, protecting me too. And yet, it was, as in every desperate place I've been, and I know all of you have experienced this too, where the people are most impoverished, they're often most generous. And one day I came out of my hotel and a man came up to me and he spoke unusually good English for Yemen. And he said, sir, would you like to look around? I said, yeah, please, what, what is there to see? And he said, the graveyard. We spent a long, hot afternoon walking around the cemetery where his mother and his sister and his father and various nuns were all buried. When we got back to my hotel, a man from the front desk who had offered to reconfirm my flight out came up to me. He said, sir, there's, there's just a small delay. I said, oh, that's no problem. How long? 
And he said, four days. <laughs> and then I looked at him and I thought, four days in a place like this really could be four years. It could be four lifetimes because Aidan just didn't seem connected to the world that I knew. And I had to be out the next day because my wife was flying all the way over from Japan to meet me in Athens and my editors were impatiently awaiting their report on the 15th century Muslim eunuch admiral. So I got into a car and we bumped across this potholed road in the falling darkness through the center of town, which improbably was called Crater. And I went into the Yemenia Airlines office and there was a large woman in a black veil there. And I presented to her my predicament. She very slowly, laboriously tapped out on an ancient computer the, the possibilities. And she turned to me and she said, the only way I could leave the country was then and there driving all the way across the country to the very northern city of Sana'a and flying out the next morning at 6 a.m. This was not such good news because, as I said, North Yemen and South Yemen had been at war for most of the previous years. It was less good news because the traditional source of revenue for all the villages en route was the kidnapping of foreigners. And it was least good news because check-in was seven hours later. It was a six-hour drive. But I thought, well, I have no option. So I, I said, yes, I'll take it. And she very, very carefully made out a new ticket, and then she wrote out a receipt. Then she gave me $40 because my new ticket was worth less than my previous ticket. And I stumbled out into the dark to try to find anybody um, who was so crazy he would take me across the country then and there. And finally, a, a small old man showed up. And we got into this battered white Peugeot station wagon. He got behind the wheel. <laughs> I got the sense he'd never been behind the wheel of a car before. And we took off into the dark. And very soon we were up in the highlands. It's pitch black, nothing to be seen except these little lights coming from the arrow slit medieval tower houses of rural Yemen. And it began to rain, and the car started to slither across the road. And I noticed on one side of us there was a sheer precipice. And we drove around a corner, and there was a roadblock. And there were suddenly maybe 15 teenage boys with AK-47s, and they surrounded the car. And the old man, I guess, told them what they wanted to hear or slipped them some money or told them I was a, a, a local Yemeni, and they let us go. And we went around another turn. There was another roadblock, more kids with assault rifles, and then another, and then another. And it was one of those times, and again, most of you have known them, when I just realized I had to give up. There was nothing I could do to make this turn out well. I was in the hands of the heavens, or however you wanted to define it. And we came to the top of a mountain, and there was nothing there. And suddenly, the driver stopped. And he opened the door, and he got out, and he disappeared. And I waited, and I waited, and I waited in the silence and in the dark. And finally, after what seemed like a very long time, he came back. And I tapped impatiently at my watch because we didn't have much time. And he opened his hands uh, to show me a can of Coke and a bar of chocolate. He was really worried I'd missed out on my dinner in my hurry to leave. And he'd gone a long way out of his way to try and find me dinner. So we, got, um, we began getting closer to the capital. And the first call to prayer came up. And the first light came into the sky. Then we got to the capital, and it was just these huge empty boulevards with oil drums in the middle, and again, lots of boys with very serious weapons. It looked like South Central Los Angeles. And we, neither of us knew our way around the city, of course, but then we saw an air control tower. So we drove towards it, and I just pushed some banknotes into the old man's hand, and I raced into the terminal, and I just managed to make my flight. And so two hours later, I was in Dubai, where you can literally buy a Maserati in the airport terminal, and where there's that seven-star hotel just down the road. And I was thinking about that poor old man having to brave all those roadblocks and who knows what just to try to get back home. And by chance, five weeks later, I was back in my mother's house in California. And one day, I was sitting at my desk, and I was trying to think how I could possibly put Santa Barbara, this privileged bubble, in the same sentence as what I'd seen in Aden. And just at that moment, my mother raced into the room. And she said, that crazy place you were visiting just last month, it's on all these TV screens because there were these planes flying into the World Trade Center. And we're told that the pilots are Saudi, but they're masterminded by some guy called Bin Laden, whose ancestral home village is in Yemen. And we're being told that Yemen is the center of, of darkness and threat. 
And I was so glad at that moment, just again by being a blundering tourist, that I could remember that kind man who'd taken me around the cemetery. And the woman in the Yemenia Airlines office who could or probably should have pocketed the $40 she so honestly gave to me, it would have meant much more to her. And the old man who'd probably risked his life to help save mine. And of course, 15 years on, Yemen is in a much worse situation. It's before Ukraine and Afghanistan, it was called the worst human rights crisis on the planet, a civil war within a civil war. And I read that there were 600 members of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula in Yemen, but there were 30 million other people there. And almost everybody I met was desperate to come to New York and had friends here and probably um, cast most of their dreams upon the United States. So I was just reading a book by the former British Foreign Secretary, David Miliband, uh, who's now in charge of refugees. And he described meeting a photojournalist who was consecrating his life to chronicling the refugee situation. And the photographer turned to him and he said, you know, when you look at the statistics, you just feel despair. But when you look at the faces, you see hope. And so really, I'm just so grateful to everyone in this room for working so hard and constantly to turn statistics into faces and thus despair into hope. Uh, thank you so much for listening, and we have 10 minutes for questions. Thank you. And I think there's a roaming mic, so please don't be shy. If you don't ask questions, I'm going to have to <laughs> keep talking, which I'm sure you don't want. <laughs> Is there a hand up anywhere? Oh, good. There's a hand. Is there one experience in my tra travel life that? Maybe uh, in 1985, just after Tibet had opened to the larger world, I managed to make my way there. And in those days, Lhasa, the capital, was just this cluster of whitewashed buildings. It was very, very undeveloped under the Patala Palace, which sits on a ridge above the town with its thousand rooms and the lights burning in each room, almost like a kind of protective presence. Very, very magical place. And I think my first morning there, I made the ascent up to the Patala Palace where generations of Dalai Lamas have lived. And it's a very powerful place. There are monks chanting in every corner and these beautiful statues and tankas. And I walked out onto a terrace uh, and maybe it was the altitude because I was at 12,000 feet and maybe it was kind of jet lag and maybe it was culture shock. But I was standing under these great cobalt skies with the mountains in the distance and a valley filled with willow trees down below. And I really felt not just that I was on the rooftop of the world, as Tibet is known, this uh, unnaturally beautiful place, but on the rooftop of my being. I felt I was in some kind of state of being I'd never experienced living in New York City or anywhere else before. And I made a strange kind of counterintuitive decision then and there. And I decided I'll never experience this again. And so I'm going to leave Lhasa after four days so that my four days will always be this perfectly shaped magical interlude. In other words, I won't stay and stay and stay and make it seem every day. I'll keep it as, as a kind of gleaming uh, image in my head. Um, and so I did leave uh, three days later. And I've been back a couple of times, and it's very different now. But I was glad that uh, I didn't linger then. And I still remember 37 years later as if I'm still standing on that whitewashed terrace looking out over that uh, silent valley. And Tibet exerts this kind of magic on many people, you probably know. Uh, in 1903, there was a delegation of British soldiers who went there, led by somebody called Francis Young Husband. And as they marched towards Lhasa, they killed 700 Tibetans. The Tibetans were, uh, their only weapon was an amulet <laughs> blessed by the Dalai Lama. And of course, the British had guns and many other things. So they wiped out every part of Tibet they could get. They went to Lhasa and the Patala Palace. They had a discussion with a regent. And after the discussion on his last afternoon in Lhasa, the soldier who had led this uh, delegation, a young husband, went for a walk in the mountains. And when he came back from his walk, 
he decided to devote the rest of his life to peace. He gave up being a soldier. He returned to Europe. And for the next, I think, 30 years, all he tried to do was bring peace to the rest of the world. Um, it's like something out of the movie Lost Horizon. And there are certain places that have this charisma and magnetism. You've, you've all found them, I'm sure. And as with people, you can't really explain what it is. But there's something about them that changes you uh, as nothing else could. So that's one moment. Thank you for asking. Yes, please. Thank you very much. I think, I think the question was about my, um, my process and how I get things down as I'm in a new place. I think the first thing I do is my first 48 hours, I just walk and walk and walk everywhere with my little notebook, which is pretty much the only thing I have. And I just, it's like meeting a fascinating stranger and you want to hear her life story. So just letting the place speak to me, listening to it, taking notes on everything, going down every last little street. Uh, and every maybe two and a half, three hours, I'll stop and have a cup of tea and process it. And then when I go back to my hotel at the end of the day, I'll write it up in full paragraphs because that's how you catch the emotion. If you're just making scrap little short notes, that's not catching the feeling. And I won't be rich enough ever to go back to that place or to experience that first day again. So I want to get it down then and there before it disappears. And if I go to a place where it's not possible to walk, I will get on a bus and get off at the last stop or take a subway or whatever. As soon as I arrived in uh, the Sheraton yesterday afternoon, the first thing I did was just walk down Main Street as far as I could and then come back along the riverfront. I couldn't get much from that, but I could at least begin to orient myself and see what was interesting. And I do that for the first 48 hours because after about three days, I find ideas begin to form, explanations. And at that point, I only see everything that confirms them. I only see everything in the light of my expectations. I'll say Memphis is a such and such town, and I'll just transcribe things that deepen that rather than that challenge it. But those first 48 um, hours are very important. And I notice when I go back home, um, and so I still keep, as I say, writing, writing everything up while I'm in the site. So I will come back from a two-week trip with maybe 40 or 50 handwritten pages of A4. And then, ideally, I will wait for two weeks or two months and then ask myself a variation on the first question today. What moved me most? What surprised me most? And how can I live differently in the light of what I experienced? How can I bring Tibet or Havana or Jerusalem into my life in Japan or New York City? Uh, and sometimes there's a tight deadline, and I have to write it very quickly. But I try to let memory do the, the Sifting, And I often will leave all those notes on one side uh, of the room. And just imagine I met a friend, and she said to me, what was so amazing about Iceland? And I'd start to talk to her. And that's probably how I should start my story. So a whole different set of procedures based on the, on the writing process. And of course, the beauty of the writing process is you get surprised by it, and same as in the walking process. Um, I see Matt flashing a five-minute sign, so probably time for one more question. Good, and lady in purple is quickly got a hand up. And I find the most difficult places, like, or the, the most stigmatized places, like, like Iran and Cuba, are the friendliest. And people are so keen to, to meet somebody from the United States, and they don't often see many of us, that I was actually warned before I went to Iran by friends who'd been there, oh, you've got to watch out. Everybody's going to want to invite you to dinner. Everyone's going to want to be your friend. And the only reason that didn't happen to me was most people assumed I was Iranian. And I do have that advantage that if I'm in Cuba or Indonesia or Iran, I can pass as a local. And I think being a man makes me a little more reckless maybe than, than if I were a, a young woman or an older woman too. But um, I don't take precautions. And one thing that often surprises me, both when I went to Iran and North Korea, I have a British passport too. And I asked uh, people who are professionals in this uh, area, and in both cases, they said, oh, definitely use your American passports. Iran, curiously, has had, well, 
is the one place I've met where they dislike Canadians. So don't put your maple leaf on your backpack if you're going to Iran. And it's also, like so many places, this has 700 years of bad experiences with the English, but only 60 years of bad experiences with the US. So we are looked on very favorably. When you get there, you find the word for devil and the word for English person is the same. <laughs> and you go to a beautiful site in Iran, and every one of them says, this was beautiful until the British came here. But there's very little talk about American devastation because it's so, so recent. So I, I would say don't don't worry about being American in those places. I remember when I began my traveling life was in the 1980s. I was in my 20s and I was going to lots of war zones in those days, in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Honduras, Cuba a lot, Philippines, the Philippines during its tumult. Nothing bad ever happened to me. And then I came back to probably the most protected seeming city on the planet, Santa Barbara, and my house burned to the ground in a wildfire with me inside of it for three hours. And it just reminded me, as you said, one can never anticipate these things, and danger is often much closer to home than um, you would expect. I remember I acquired an American passport in 2004. And the first place I was going to after that was Beirut. And I thought, well, it's better to be an English person there, at least. So I called up the British consul, and they said, yeah, yeah, please use a British passport. And as I was in Frankfurt on boarding the final plane with the final passport check, the guy said, sorry, British people aren't allowed in. I said, I checked two months ago that things have changed, because they're always changing in a place like Beirut. So they had to take me off the plane, and the guy was going through all the paperwork to get my bags off the plane and to cancel my seven-day trip. And he said, it's such a shame. I really want to help you. I wish you had any passport other than a British. I said, well, I do have American. Oh, Americans, no problem. Come on in. <laughs> Americans welcome in Beirut. And I suppose the takeaway I get from that is you just can't anticipate. Things are so crazy in every country and across the planet and so endlessly unexpected that most of the precautions I've taken have been useless. And when something bad has happened, it's been nothing I ever expected, uh, which is true in life, too. Everything good or bad that's happened to me has come out of the blue, and uh, whether at home or at travel. So again, thank you very much. I think we're at 5 o'clock, but thank you all for listening. <laughs> <laughs>